Hi guys, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Please, please, please could ask you a huge favour and that is if you've ever found my channel useful during GCSEs or at any point, please may I ask you to subscribe, it would mean the world to me. Um, however, this video is going to be on standard level IB and A level biology and we're going to be looking at the bacterial cells. We're looking at the structure particularly of a bacterial cell, we're going to look at the various roles, talk about things like the cell wall and what the difference between a gram negative and gram positive bacteria is. Remember there are eukaryotes and prokaryotes, so eukaryotes are things like animal cells, plant cells which contain membrane bound organelles. Bacterial cells and viruses are both prokaryotes because they don't have membrane bound organelles. And that's simply because of their size. Now remember the bacterial cells are very small and they're actually about the same size as a chloroplast and a mitochondria. They're literally the same size pretty much. So no wonder a bacterial cell can't contain mitochondria because it's simply too small. So try and remember that when we remember the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So looking more closely at the structure of a bacterial cell, you see that they're kind of rectangular shaped similar to a plant cell, but rather than having a cell wall made out of cellulose, the cell walls in a bacterial cell tend to be made out of peptidoglycan, which is made up of amino acids and sugars. Like the cell wall in a plant, it helps to re retain the structure of that bacterial cell so it protects it from external harm. It keeps all the organelles within the bacterial cell and helps to prevent that bacterial cell from rupturing due to osmosis, because remember osmosis is all to do with water movement. So, the difference between gram positive and gram negative bacteria now. Now the thing to be aware of here is differences in how they stain. So the gram stain is a stain added to bacterial cells. Now gram positive bacteria turn purple when you add this stain which is crystal violet to them and that's because their cell walls are mainly made out of peptidoglycan. This means that they can absorb the stain so they turn purple. Now gram negative bacteria contain only a small amount of peptidoglycan, they have thin walls and they have an outer membrane which has a high lipid content and what that means is they don't as readily accept that crystal violet colour which means they don't turn purple so we call them gram negative. I remember gram was the name of a scientist who actually discovered this stain in the first place. As I've already told you bacterial cells don't contain membrane bound organelles so you won't find a nucleus or mitochondria, you will find instead the DNA as a circular strand or a chromosome and we call that the nucleoid. They have more genes in the form of plasmids which are small circles of DNA. Remember you learnt that they were involved in genetic engineering in GCSE biology. And you tend to find in these plasmids that they contain the genes which are responsible for antibiotic resistance. So remember increasingly we add antibiotics to kill bacteria but increasingly we're finding that they're resistant and that they mutate and are no longer harmed by antibiotics and it's because of genes found within their plasmids which actually give them some resistance to antibiotics. Their ribosomes now, they have smaller ribosomes compared with animal cells, so they contain 70S ribosomes which are found freely within the cytoplasm and not attached to endoplasmic reticulum. Indeed, they don't have rough endoplasmic reticulum. The tail, which we call the flagella, is sometimes present which enables the bacterial cell to move and they have pili which look like small flagella which help them to attach to each other and to various surfaces, but again, not necessarily always there. Now, the mesosome, is a structure which people for a very long time didn't know what it was used for, people came up with different functions for it. It is indeed an artifact, which means it's an artificial thing that humans have accidentally added to the bacterial cell and then they misguidedly thought that it was part of the bacterial cell, but instead it actually comes about by using electron microscopy to actually look at the bacterial cell. These small artifacts end up deposited on the bacterial cell, they're nothing to do with the bacteria. Now viruses, another form of prokaryotes, they are always pathogenic which means that they're always disease causing and we tend to say that they are non-living and that's because they can't carry out any metabolic reactions by themselves which means that they can't actually carry out chemical processes on their own because remember viruses hijack other cells so we call these host cells and actually hijack the internal machinery of these other cells and use them for their own bidding. So the virus can't do anything by itself, it cannot replicate by itself, it cannot grow by itself, it cannot reproduce, instead it needs to infect other organisms and that's part of the reason why they're so difficult to target. In terms of their structure they have a core which is a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, which is surrounded by a protein coat known as a capsid. 
Some have an additional external envelope which surrounds the capsid, which is made up out of lipids and proteins, which is the case in HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. They're difficult to treat because of this lack of cell machinery and instead treatments, antivirals have to be aimed at preventing the virus replication. They're also extremely hard to classify because they don't have lots of common features which enables you to classify them. Instead, we have to classify them based on the shape of their capsid, the nucleic acids they contain, how they infect hosts and how they replicate. Now, in terms of studying viruses, the way in which we tend to choose to do this is by examining their effects on bacteria. And a virus which infects a bacteria is known as a bacteriophage. So what happens is the virus comes along and it injects its nucleic acid into the bacteria, leaving its capsid behind. The bacterial cell produces more of these bacteriophages and eventually the cell bursts and releases more phage particles which can then go off and infect lots of other bacteria. While this happens, obviously the bacterial cell bursts and that's why we call this a lytic cycle. Now one interesting thing to notice about viruses is that they can exhibit viral latency and what that means is they can infect an organism but not actually cause any harm. So what they do is they remain dormant for many years until for some reason or another they become active again and start causing disease within that organism. The nucleic acid infects the host cell but it doesn't overtake the metabolism of the cell. There are two types of latency. The first one is episomal latency, which is where the nucleic acid remains free within the cytoplasm of the host cell and is inactive. The second type is proviral latency, and this is when the nucleic acid of the virus becomes incorporated into the DNA of the host cell. It's now known as a provirus and it can become activated at any time. And a good example when we look at latency is to discuss chickenpox. Now chickenpox is caused by the virus varicella zoster and we know this is fairly innocuous in children. It causes chickenpox which is pretty unpleasant. You come up with lots of itchy spots. It doesn't tend to be life-threatening. However, varicella zoster can remain dormant or latent within the nerve cells of humans. So it just sits there for many years, not causing any problems, but it's still there. It is inactive and it exhibits episomal latency, which means that its nucleic acid is free within that nerve cell. However, when you become older, what can happen is that varicella zoster virus can become active, and it can actually cause a really horrible disease called shingles in older people, and that's why people get nervous. They prefer their children to have chickenpox when they're younger, because they're unlikely to get shingles when they're older. So let's look at a few examples of different viruses, starting with Lambda virus. And this is the name of the virus which infects a bacteria called E. coli. So it has a really distinctive shape with a head and a tail, and it contains as its nucleic acid double-stranded DNA, and that when these nucleic acids are replicated, they are converted to mRNA within the host cell. So within E. coli, the double-stranded DNA will be transcribed to produce mRNA. The tobacco mosaic virus infects plants and gives them characteristic yellow spots and actually inhibits their ability to photosynthesize. Again, they have a very different shape to the lambda virus. Instead, they have the capsid, the protein coat, which is arranged as a spiral made up of little building blocks of polypeptides. And within that spiral, you find the RNA, which is the nucleic acid of the tobacco mosaic virus. And in terms of copying their genetic information, the RNA is simply directly copied to become mRNA. Ebola virus, now that was in the news an awful lot a couple of years ago and caused the death of hundreds of thousands of people in Africa. Now that infects human cells, obviously, including ones found in the liver and the immune system and also endothelial cells. They have a simple structure, which is that their RNA is surrounded by the protein coat or the capsid. And then nucleic acid is found as a single-stranded RNA molecule, which is again copied directly to mRNA by the host cell. HIV now, a human immunodeficiency virus, they have quite a complex structure. So they have a single-stranded RNA surrounded by a protein coat, which contains enzymes and also glycoproteins. They have a really complicated way of copying themselves, so they reverse transcribe, which means although they exist as an RNA molecule, when they infect the host cell, they cause the host cell to convert the RNA back into DNA, which is then incorporated into the host DNA, so it can then be transcribed in a normal way in protein synthesis to become mRNA. So pretty complicated. So that's everything 
to do with the summary of bacterial cells. I hope you found it helpful. Don't forget to subscribe and also like this video if you'd like to see more.